You're listening to the Deerfield Public Library podcast, February 15th, 2024. Every step you take is a, you know, it's like a ripple effect. It opens up a, a new venue, a new doorway, and more choices. Welcome to the Deerfield Public Library podcast. I'm Dylan Zavagno, Adult Services Coordinator at the Library. Today I have the honor of sharing a conversation I had last week with author Amina Gautier, whose recent collection of short stories titled The Best That You Can Do was just published a few weeks ago by Soft Skull Press. Amina Gautier is the author of three previous story collections, At Risk from 2011, Now We Will Be Happy from 2014, and The Loss of All Lost Things from 2016. She is the recipient of the Blackwell Prize, the Chicago Public Library Foundation's 21st Century Award, the International Latino Book Award, the Flannery O'Connor Award, and the Phyllis Wheatley Award in Fiction. For her body of work, she has received the Penn Malamud Award for Excellence in the Short Story. The Best That You Can Do, the new collection, was published as the winner of the inaugural Soft Skull Kimbilio Publishing Prize. Kimbilio for Black Fiction is a community of writers and scholars committed to developing, empowering, and sustaining fiction writers from the African diaspora and their stories. Amina lives in Chicago. This is a fascinating discussion about agency, identity, culture, and the very short story form that she's exploring in this excellent new collection for our time. Here's our conversation. Amina, it is an honor to talk to you. Over the past couple weeks, I have read and reread your four story collections. And one thing to say about these stories is how once you start an Amina Gautier story, you can't stop. I found these very addicting. And there's just an incredible range of subject and style. And I think Part of what the stories are teaching us is about the range of human experience. I'm somebody that learns about the world through fiction and poetry primarily, and I don't know if I have the words really to describe these stories, so here's my generalizations, that they teach me something about the human heart, how it lives and half survives and tries to define itself and makes daring or half-daring choices within our limitations. And if that's not enough, they also give us a real sense of what it's like to live now and has been over the past few decades. The language is also beautiful and exacting. So I think before we hear a story, it seemed to me that the previous collections were grouped together somewhat thematically. Whereas this new collection, The Best That You Can Do, it's broken up into thematic sections, but it seemed really tied together to me through form and through this form of the short, short story. Many of the stories are only a couple pages long. They're often narrated by a we, a second person. This short form can do all sorts of different things, I think. There's a lot of lists, maybe because it's compressed, but they sort of seem to me like jokes sometimes or poems or songs. So can you just tell me about how you think about the form? Well, they're not poems. I will say that. (laughs) But they can definitely be jokes and songs. So thank you so much, Dylan, for for having me. And you're right. This collection focuses on what I'm calling very short fiction. I hesitate to use the word short, short, because some of them are a little bit longer, but no story in this collection goes over 2,500 words. So I do think that some of them count as flash fiction, short shorts, but that they all count as very short fiction. They all fall under the traditional word count length of 3,000 words that we would ascribe to a traditional length story. And because the stories are so short, they did give me an opportunity to play and create and and innovate because you don't have full dramatic sequences as you would have in a traditional length story. So you can't always create your conflict through scenes. So I'm using language and narrative pressure instead. Like these stories include more lyricism, I think, than my longer ones do. So I'm using the punctuation, the language, the rhythm, and the cadence to take the place of 
the seam where we would typically expect our conflict, right? So the conflict is sort of pushed forward in these pieces by who's speaking, the language, the form. So some stories are written as as songs, which you mentioned, Mean to Me, for example, is all one sentence, and it's meant to have the rhythm of a song. It has a chorus, it has a bridge. So I am playing a lot with form. I'm not saying I'm not saying that people can't play with form with traditional length stories, but there is, you know, there is a tricky there's this tricky area to navigate where if you're focusing too much on form with a 15 page story or 20 page story, so a, a 5,000 word story, it can start to feel like a gimmick. Right, that that yeah. the only thing important in the story is the form, and you're just like repeating something. Whereas with something short, your readers can get that flash of intuition or enlightenment, and they could still grasp the undercurrents of the story without feeling like they're being overly manipulated. I think. Mm. Wow. Well, because when we talked on the phone earlier, you said, "Well, these stories are funnier," and I thought, "Well, I know some moments from Amina Gautier's stories earlier that." just stick with me like in the story directory assistance i think one of your funniest stories i'll never forget a character is talking about an ex-boyfriend a conversation they had uh, he doesn't want to have kids so he asked do you want to have kids and she says i don't know if i do she said she took a sip of the smoothie she purchased at, at the jamba juice trying to taste the bee pollen infusion but I don't know that I don't. And that <laughs> trying to taste the bee pollen infusion, <laughs> it's stuck with me. It's so funny trying to get something there that maybe isn't there. But these short shorts are these very shorts, I'll call them, you know, sometimes will like end with a punchline, like love is not FDIC insured was a, <laughs> a good line. <laughs> Would you do us the honor of reading Buen Provecho? the second story in the new collection, The Best That You Can Do. And it's from the first section. So there's five different sections in this, the first section called Quarter Rican. All right. Buen provecho. We will never learn to speak Spanish. Our mother fights us every step of the way. She wants nothing to do with her father's language, nothing that reminds her of him, including herself. We've seen the proof in the pictures, those Polaroids from the 70s capturing her attempts at being a foxy mama. She tried to transform her fine hair into an afro, hoping the dew would make the neighbors stop asking her what she was mixed with and put an end to the Puerto Ricans calling out to her on the street in a language she didn't speak. She'd heard that beer would kink her hair and lend it body, but all she'd ended up with were drunken curls. Because we know the lengths to which she'll go, we keep our efforts secret and learn behind her back. On Saturdays, we work on our weekly book reports at the Stone Avenue Public Library. And on our way home, we stop to visit our grandfather's sister who lives in the projects nearby. Our Titi buzzes us up. And when we get off on her floor, she's standing in her doorway, waiting for us to get off the elevator, watching out to ensure we arrive in one piece. She closes the door behind us and turns a series of locks before sliding on the safety chain. Then she hugs us and says, come on in kids, how are you? We hug back and respond, no hablamos ingles, and our weekly game begins. For the rest of our visit, she'll speak only Spanish. It doesn't matter that we can't answer, let alone understand. We soak up her words, guess at their meanings and do our best to follow along. After she sets the table, our titi tells us, siéntense, and we take our seats. When she sets the food before us, arroz con pollo, arroz con gandules, arroz con jueyes, arroz con habichuelas, always arroz con something, we say gracias, and she pats our cheeks in approval. Before we take our first bites, she says, buen provecho, and makes us repeat the same. We eat our fill of plates piled high with rice as our titi fills our ears with words. We remember please and thank you and I'm sorry and just a handful more. Not enough to make a sentence, just enough to not offend. Our titi says these words are the bare necessities and that politeness will take us far. Just before we leave, she bends and cries, besos, besos, covers us in kisses and makes us promise to come again soon. She wants us to give our mother her love, but of course our mother can't know that we were ever here. 
We sling our book bags across our shoulders and troop out past the kids playing in the courtyard, past the teens leaning on the fences and checking their beepers, past the cars driving by with their booming systems, and past street after street of housing projects on the way to our own. We practice rolling our R's all the way home. Arroz, we say, gagging at the back of our throats, struggling to master the trill. Arroz, arroz, arroz. We sound like pirates, angry, gargling pirates, but we don't care. We only have 10 blocks to practice. Once we turn up our street, we have to put our words away. Still, they slip out when we're not careful. Hours after we've shown off our trove of borrowed books and our mother has checked our homework, she's at the sink straining the spaghetti for dinner when my brother points to my chair and whispers, Siéntate. Siéntate, I whisper in response, pointing back at his. As if we've rehearsed it for a dance routine, we sit at the same time and scoot ourselves forward. Our mother joins us at the kitchen table and we link hands and bow our heads and close our eyes to say grace. She squeezes our fingers at the end of the prayer to signal that we could eat. Taking up our forks, we twirl our spaghetti, forget ourselves and say to each other, buen provecho. Our mother's head snaps up. What was that, she asks. What did you say? Nothing, we lie. You know I don't like that kind of talk, she says. I don't want to hear that in my house. We hang our heads and squirm under her scrutiny, afraid to meet her eyes. She leaves her food untouched and watches us instead, eyes scanning back and forth between us as we sit quietly and do our best to pretend this whole thing never happened until she suddenly pushes her plate away and rushes from the table. If only we could say that we ran right after her, fast on her heels to apologize for the error of our ways. But even though our pipi fed us only hours ago, we are hungry once again. Before we check on our mother, we finish our meals. After we've cleaned our plates, we polish off hers. Once we've eaten everything in sight, we seek her out and find her in her bedroom curled into a ball on the top of her comforter, her back to the light shining in from the hallway. We didn't mean to make her cry. We're sorry, Ma, we call from the doorway. We didn't mean the words we said. She flinches when she hears our voices, covers her hands with her ears, and curls her body even tighter. I just don't want to hear that. We leave our words behind as we kick off our shoes and climb onto her bed and pry our mother apart. We each take a side and surround her, close as mercy, as we uncurl her legs and burrow beneath her arms. We soothe her into silence, patting her shoulders and back to beg pardon, huddling close to make her hush. Drowsy with dinner and the warmth of our mother, we sleep glued to her all night. In the morning, she'll forgive us, and we'll put this all behind us. We'll never speak of this night again. No, we will never say another word. <laughs> That's amazing. There's so much to say about this story. There's this joy the children have in finding language and then this betrayal that they can't speak it. And I wanted to ask you about this. It's an idea that appears over and over in the stories where usually in the African-American Puerto Rican families, the kids might be expected in some of these stories to either align themselves or disavow themselves to one so-called side of their family. And it could be because of a family members' bad associations with some estranged person or sort of a larger cultural dimension or even physical distance. And sometimes this is very painful. I kept thinking with this story of the story from your second collection, Remembering, mm -hmm. from Now We Will Be Happy, and the narrator is talking to his brother, and they're estranged from their mother, and this brother has found their estranged mother. And I'm just going to read a short quote here. Julio wanted me to understand something. I couldn't let myself understand. He didn't want us to be black, Julio said. Stop it, I said. He didn't want to have to feel ashamed of us, he said. Shut up, I said, trying to pull away. And this idea of I couldn't let myself understand, I thought that might be one of your great themes <laughs> of these things that... Are, we sort of half know, can't help but live by, and 
as I read and reread these stories, I started to hear some lines. Like there was a line from Feliz Navidad. We play the record and sing along to a song whose words we do not understand. And it started echoing through the whole book and your whole work. Can you talk about this idea? Am I onto something here? Well, you're quite brilliant, of course. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, well, one of the things I'm playing with with the with the language part, you know, is that you hear a lot of people whose parents, you know, have lived in other countries sort of say, my parents that didn't teach me the language or, you know, different things like that. I wanted to play with the idea that each iteration, that, that when you're separated from something, it's a choice. People can sort of read blueprints on your face and your hair, or they could not. But choosing to immerse yourself in a language, in a culture that you have some level of distance with can be an act of agency, and rejecting it can also be an act of agency that, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, well, you don't speak Spanish because you didn't take it in school or because your parents didn't teach it to you as if it's just this kind of like educational thing. But there can be emotional and psychological weight, right, to, to learning to speak another language, right? So there are different members in the family who just refuse to make that step right because they associate that with aligning with or approving certain like familial history mm -hmm. and then there are younger generations who weren't part of that trauma who see that as a way of like connecting or reconciling or feeling that the language is something that they're owed right that it becomes like an inheritance right and i didn't want to create monolithic characters Right, like my family is is mixed with African American and Puerto Rican in a bunch of different ways. So I am a Puerto Rican. You know, my my grandfather is Puerto Rican. My mother, I'm sorry, my grandfather is Puerto Rican. My grandmother is African American. My mother is, you know, half and half. She's got two brothers. My mother had zero interest in speaking Spanish, but totally wanted me to go to Puerto Rico and like get everything that I could get. Whereas one of her brothers is like a Salcedo. He's like totally identifies. And then his two kids don't, right? Like each person like is different and, and can make that choice if it wasn't something that they were surrounded with. And, you know, we've all made different choices based on the way we identify who we feel we're hurting, right? Like in this story, when Provecho, the kids have a right to learn that language if they want to. It's it's part of their family. Their aunt can teach them, but their mother has a specific sort of traumatic relationship with it, so they can't learn it openly without wounding her, right? So there's all this, this, this emotional component to the language. Yes. I wondered how this showed up in your writing project overall, and I, I heard a talk that you gave maybe 10 years ago where you said you specifically were trying not to learn Spanish in order to write your character, Rosa, who's yes. in those stories, oh, wow, and now we will be happy. <laughs> and I thought that oh, this is a writer who's really trying to make words out of no words and <laughs> is actually, you're trying to write us into these places we don't understand, even if it means not understanding or that like not understanding or refusing to learn a language or align with some person in the family can actually be its own form of knowledge. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. The thing in this section too, that I started to have this idea of, which relates to what we were just talking about was like separateness or wholeness. And there's a character in the first story, what she finds She's falling in love with Inez's brother. That's how we learn of his, who this person is. It's described, she too has a bevy of siblings. And though she loves them all, it's hard to ever feel the separateness that she needs to define herself. So she needs that separateness. Then later, she thinks about her kids in a different story being sent to Puerto Rico and making a way and thinks, don't the children have all the family they need? But there is more than blood to consider. There is inheritance 
another entire language inside their heads waiting to be awakened, a language lying dead upon their tongues that you cannot call to life. This is what you want for them, to be all the pieces of themselves. With that idea of range of human experience, I thought you're sort of showing us that whether we're seeking separateness or wholeness, there's no guarantee on what happens with either of those paths, right? Right. Right. There's no guarantee that, oh, now that you speak this or now that you go there, everything <laughs> is going to be fine. Like every step you take is a, you know, it's like a ripple effect. It opens up a, a new venue, a new doorway and more choices. I always, I don't know that this, this correlation will make sense to other people, but when I'm, you know, thinking about like, like these characters needing to make these choices and the parents deciding whether they want to support that or whether they want to kind of like, you know, get in the way and, and sabotage it. I think about children of divorce, right? And you can divorce a spouse for, you know, very negative reason and not want the child to be around like that particular parent. But then what do you decide about how that child has access to the extended family, right? Like mm -hmm. maybe that parent is not good for them to be around, but what about those grandparents? And what about those aunts? And what about those uncles? Like, do you have a, a right to keep them away from them? You know, is there a way that they can connect? You know, like that's yeah, yeah. that's the metaphor that I like was thinking of where I thought that if people read these stories and they might not be able to make the linguistic connections, like that there are these other correlations that I think that we frequently struggle with and you never know if you're making the right decision. Yeah. Well, this is another thing that fascinates me about the stories is sort of how they talk back to older literature. And it's sort of in the same vein of like everything just becomes part of another choice. So like, I'll never forget this moment. It's in your previous collection, The Loss of All Lost Things. It's the story As I Wander. And this character, Judy, she's a recent widow and she sees this young man going there's mm -hmm. these men going in and out of a a gay professor's apartment and presumably they're sex workers and she asks this boy you ever read any baldwin and it's like <laughs> it's so funny and like audacious and it sort of gets at this like weird irony about past literature that like it both knows us like James Baldwin would know exactly what was happening there but and he would even probably know what was going to happen in that story <laughs> but he doesn't know her he doesn't know Judy and she still has to live out her life even though she knows about the literature she still has to make her own mistakes in some way and I know you're also a scholar of American literature so there's this remarkable story in this collection preferences where the refrain from Herman Melville's Bartleby the Scrivener, I prefer not to, is repurposed for college date rape. And this character is described, this is incredible, as being a smart girl capable of appreciating irony. That's the quote. She, she knows that she's ironically using this phrase, but she can't help by both being like empowered by and not empowered by literature. Is that true for you? <laughs> I mean, you said something at the beginning that you, you, I think you said you you learn or live your life learning through literature, fiction and poetry. And that was definitely, you know, the, the case. That is definitely the case for me, but it definitely was. I just like, <laughs> I remember being in eighth grade and uh, Christine Scott, who is a fiction writer, she was my eighth grade English teacher at the Nightingale Bamford School. And she assigned us Bliss by Catherine Mansfield, and you know, yes. oh, the pear tree. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, and I was like, oh, I can actually like learn, you know, from these stories. I can learn about the mistakes people are making. I can learn what to avoid. I like just learn. And short stories, more, more than novels, but short stories kind of became my, my teachers, you know, through, through, through life. And Obviously, I know everyone doesn't connect that way, but I do try to write my stories in such a way that people can 
people can get guidance. I believe in literary history. I believe in context. I think that all literature is in conversation with each other, whether we know it or not. So we may as well know what came before so that we can contribute to that conversation. We can correct the conversation. We can re- directed. You know, I don't expect every reader of my stories to have that contextual knowledge, but I do, you know, get this pleasurable thought that the readers who do will appreciate those little moments and, and find them, you know, like like you did, right? Like yeah. that there's the Bartleby, the, the Scrivener. You know, some people are going to just read that story. They're not going to catch that you know, or like in uh, in Breathe, you know, I've got the yeah. little moments from Hamlet Eye, there's the rub. Uh, so I'm always pulling from from literature, from literary history, from pop culture. I just, just read Gwen Provecho and I had the LL Cool J line, right? Yeah. Cars drive by with their Blooming Systems. And I love those little, little moments, but I know that some people are going to read right past them and, and hopefully it won't change the the way they understand the stories. Well, here's my big question because of all of these Gen X references. And sometimes, you know, you'll get these lists. I'll just read a little bit. This is a list I wrote down from the story before. They ply us with Mike and Ikes and Lemonheads, Jolly Ranchers and Boston Baked Beans, Now and Laters and Chico Sticks. They plug in the Ataris, pull out the Teddy Ruxpin and Cabbage Patch dolls, the Voltrons and Transformers, the He-Man and She-Ra action figures, the Gem and G.I. Joes. There's some way where those are maybe friendlier references for the characters than the literature like <laughs> literature is much more complex and it, it it can hurt you more where some of these other things are a little friendlier. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am a big believer in the importance of, of details, right? Like I don't <laughs> think you can just say they pulled out their toys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, this story collection to me is also a love letter to, to Gen X. I mean, there are characters, you know, and there are references to boomers, but I feel, you know, I, I feel like we're constantly getting forgotten and, and erased. You know, there are all these surveys that are like the boomers and the millennials. I'm like, hello, like <laughs> we're here, you know, like what about us? And I feel like people constantly are ignoring us and forgetting us and erasing us. And of course, since we're Gen X, we're like, whatever, you know, we don't care. <laughs> But I thought that it would be, you know, nice reminder, not just Tickle Me Elmo dolls, right, or or Chatty Cathy's or Betsy Wetsies, <laughs> right, that there is this, you know, specific moment and, and cultural zeitgeist of, you know, people who lived in that between state, you know, like we had computers in class, we were learning how to use them, but we didn't do our homework on them. And I feel like, we Gen Xers are just doing the best that we can to kind of like live in this between space and make sure we stay visible and people don't forget <laughs> us. So definitely wanted to ground the stories with the, those details to let people know that, you know, when we're in the, when we're in the eighties and when we're in the nineties and I loved <laughs> those toys. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I, I don't know. I I still watch gem cartoons and, and He Man, so maybe you don't want to put that in an interview. I don't know. So. I love that. I guess thinking back to the idea, like Buen Provecho ending with that, like we will never say another word again. There's other moments in your work where again people are like finding this kind of mix of like it's like twinned empowerment and disempowerment at the same mm -hmm. time, and. I'm going to read a quote from Lost and Found, the opening story to The Loss of All Lost Things. There's a boy who's been kidnapped and raped, and his kidnapper puts on the Twilight Zone. And it's this episode where – now, that, here's another. It's not literature, maybe. It's a TV show. <laughs> but it's this boy who can control everything, and he can kill who displeases him. And this is what the narrator says about what he's thinking. He has learned that this is something one can do with words, 
stretch them into softness, and push them past their meaning. Take him, for example. He prefers the word lost instead of taken. Lost is much better. Things that are taken are never given back. Things that are lost can be found. He doesn't like to think of himself as a stolen thing taken away. I, I guess I just am so moved by that and fascinated by where does that power and disempowerment come from because it's almost like not in the things themselves, right? Like it's not necessarily from the details or the story or the literature even. Yeah, one of the things I'm frequently thinking of, like so in lots of all those things, obviously I was playing with exploring all the different forms of loss that weren't just solely death. But I'm always asking myself with fiction, like, how do we get in our own way? Or when we find ourselves trapped or in an inescapable space, what things can we do to try to claim agency or to try to free ourselves or to try to find our way, which kind of evolved into the next collection, right? Like, yeah, what is the best we can do in any given situation? Like with, with what we with what we have. I, I frequently talk to students about MacGyvering their way out of things. <laughs> you know, like I'm, I'm always like, just MacGyver it. You know, like, because students are like, I got to do all this research or I've got to find all these things. I'm like, you know, give yourself a couple of items and write a story with that, like MacGyver it. Like, you know, he'll be stuck in a room and he's got like a Q-tip, you know, and a, <laughs> and a, and a, and a I don't know, a cotton ball, right? And, and he just, and he makes, something right he, he does his his best and i think that you know that's what we're frequently doing like we're taking the things that are given to us and we're trying to make something out of it and we're just doing the best that we can do at any given moment but based on where you are something you know that looks some something that looks a certain way to someone else can look differently to you based on your emotional and physical state. So with Lost and Found, you know, specifically, that episode of The Twilight Zone has always scared me. <laughs> it's like <laughs> not a scary yeah. one, you know, but that one has always scared me. And the boy in that story is clearly the villain, right? Yeah. You know, he is the he is the bad guy when you are just watching that show. But if you are a young boy around that age and you are vulnerable and you feel that all your agency has been taken, maybe he's a hero, right? To you in that space because he can do things that you can or because you wish that you had that power. And then that boy specifically is, you know, Danger Will Robinson. You know, he's also the boy from, from Lost in Space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So there are these other undercurrents and, and references, you know, if people want to dig deeper, right, for being able to to live in other states and, and spaces. So the pop culture references, they do have some of the depth that the yeah. literary ones have, you know, if, if people are willing to make those connections, like with the other episodes of The Twilight Zone, I mentioned that that's the only one that I mentioned with a kid. But when you think about the other ones in the story, you've got the you know, one with Captain Kirk, so you got one where people don't believe him, where something is really happening and no one believes him, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it brings up this question of like, has the boy been made to believe that he can't escape because there's no one to tell, right? Because no one would like believe him, right? And then there's the one where the woman is wearing the, the pig nose. I think that episode is called yeah. Beauty is in the Eye of the Beholder, right? But that episode is about you having something special or unique but losing sight of that because you want to fit in right with what everybody else has and having your perception inverted and not really being able to see what's there so like you know all the episodes that are referenced yeah. you know they're specifically chosen right we would call them our objective correlatives yeah, yeah. or i guess a film person would call them MacGuffins. i guess yeah i'm, I'm wondering if they're because I, I know some of these stories in this new collection were written you know, earlier or concurrently with some of the earlier collections. Right. But I wondered if there's been a shift for you, and it's I'll explain it <laughs> this way. 
but it's sort of an intuition I have. So maybe I'm off here, but the kind of I th- think I started thinking of it as like a signature Amina Gautier move <laughs> where like a younger character would be in this rebellion against their expected self or their own conception of themselves. And even though it might be really scary, even though they might be have, have to become a little bit of the villain, it's what is empowering to them. And it's, again, this twinned empowerment, disempowerment. So like the end of a story I love, Dance for Me, and I, I won't tell the whole story, but I'll just read the last line. And I decided to go ahead and miss myself right now, knowing that the girl I would become wouldn't know how to appreciate me at all. And then in the story Palabras from Now We Will Be Happy, the narrator's grandfather says he had left Puerto Rico in order to live, to really feel alive, and that in order to begin again, you have to forget the life that you have already led. And this leads this narrator to take on a word, a palabra, that will be his rebellion. And I wondered, first of all, if if I'm making that connection right, but then if that's shifted into these stories in the new collection into maybe more middle-aged concerns. A lot of the women are maybe more self-assured, but they are self-possessed, but they're dealing with the fear of a bad date or something. I'm thinking of stories like Why Not or Prone. I don't know. There, there's something they're vulnerable to the outside world and less to the kind of inner self-revelation. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's a <laughs> signature move. I, I hope you're not saying that I'm becoming predictable because then I'm going to have to go oh, and not at all. do something no, no, crazy. No. <laughs> but I do think of I do think of agency differently with children versus a, a, adults, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, like I've taught like a class called like writing like a, a child, and I think of agency and, and and danger like differently. You know, I definitely don't believe like when people are like, oh, I, I wish I was a child again. Children have it like so easy. <laughs> you know, they're like different sorts of of danger and different ways of having agency when you are underage, right? Mm. And when you're a, a minor and when you don't have access to money and freedom and, and things like that, like ways that you have to find power for yourself and uh, and it frequently involves, you know, I guess being sort of like defiant and, and, and rebelling against teachers or bullies or family members in small ways that won't jeopardize, you know, that won't get you kicked out on the street. And I think, and, and, you know, this is maybe just a perception, just what I've noticed in the past couple of years or a decade or so. Things might be different now that we're sort of post-pandemic, but that adults seem to be far more cautious because they seem to be aware of what the repercussions can be. You say something to this person or, you know, that that if you do something wrong, Maybe you you won't be able to pay your mortgage or you won't have a job. You won't be able to support your your family. You ostracize your friends. And now, you know, now there's no one for your children to have played. It. Like there's all these ways that adults' lives are intertwined and interdependent on one another. And you have to sort of tread carefully to not like break those threads, right? Like, and why not? She's more pressured by her chorus of friends mm. than she actually is you know the, the guy that she's on a date with he's just kind of oblivious you know mm-hmm. he's just like he's not a monster <laughs> or a villain but there's all this like social pressure from her actual friends right who are sort of trying to coerce her into a, a relationship because maybe of their own insecurities ab- about dating as adults Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know and if it were a kid in that situation we'd be like these they're bullies right 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 right. (laughs) but but as adults it's you know like it's this it's this different thing to explore i don't know i don't know that i have an, an answer for it but i i am i'm fascinated by the way 
once we get to a certain age, we seem to be less risky and and less brave and seem to be more interested in preserving what mm. we have, right? And not wanting to like give it up or take a chance or, you know, say what's really on your mind. We sort of like temper our language. And I, it's just something I've been playing with for a while. Mm. Well, I wanted to ask then about the more directly political stories, because you are sort of moving away from this kind of direct realism. They're mm-hmm. not they're not stories of inner revelation. They're almost, I started to think of them actually only last night as I was thinking about this conversation. I thought, oh, these are Amina's Twilight Zone stories. These are meant to give us that sensation of we're going to have to use these to come up with our own words. But but tell me about if this is a, a shift for you or how you think about that. I think you probably know that I write multiple stories at the at the yes. same time. <laughs> so like you said, there are plenty of stories in this collection that were, you know, old, like value judgments. You mentioned like I wrote that in like 2002 and preferences mm. I wrote in, in 05. But more than half of the stories, I would say maybe like 36 or 37 of them, I wrote since 2015. And I was working on a different project with full length traditional stories. And then the 2016 election and the Black Lives Matter movement and the sort of increased visibility of racial violence and police brutality really sapped my creative energy, Mm -hmm. right? And I couldn't write about, I couldn't work on the stories that I was, was working on because I was so upset and, and, and troubled. And I felt like I didn't have a lot of power, you know, beyond protesting, but what I could do was capture the moment, right? Like I think that writers, fiction writers and poets and all kinds of writers that feel like we work alongside historians. We provide, you know, the, the, the details. So someone can't look back on this period of time and erase it and, and, and act like these moments didn't happen, right? Because the fiction writers and the, and the poets captured it as it was occurring and, you know, and we recorded it and we documented it and, and, and we left it there. And the moments just kept coming, right? It's not like they started happening in 2016, but there was more and more and more. And I just felt like my writing was being choked. Like I too couldn't breathe creatively mm-hmm. unless I channeled it or unless I said something and I just couldn't ignore it. So a lot of those stories were written between 2016 and 2020. And then I thought I would go back to the other projects with longer stories and the pandemic hit. And I didn't have the emotional capacity to to write a 20 page story, you know, like just isolated, depressed, worried about my family and my friends, not knowing when it was going to end. And the the best that I could do was to just sort of sit down and write in like brief flashes, right? To to write a four page story, right? And and capture something and to go back two weeks later and, and do another one. And to be socially isolated, to sort of be alone in my apartment in Chicago. I was like watching a lot of (laughs) <laughs> old TV <laughs> runs like there's this public channel that plays like Odd Couple and <laughs> like, Taxi and Cheers and yeah, Love yeah. Boat. It's like watching all of that, and you know that filtered into my stories. But if you're if you're confused or unhappy about the present moment that you're in, so specifically I'm saying the pandemic, you know one of the things that can help you creatively is to to regress to go back to <laughs> a moment that you felt was, you know, more safe, more fun. So for me, the late 70s, early 80s, and that was the only way I could keep my creative sanity to write these political stories and then to change form during the pandemic. Wow. Well, and I'll just say to listeners who haven't read it yet will understand there's story monuments where there's a statue of Nat Turner. It's like a counterfactual and 
there's a white woman who says, well, we have to take that down, that he killed my great, 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 great grandparents. And then could you imagine, it's, it is almost a Twilight Zone ending. Could you imagine if we had Confederate statues? <laughs> I thought we would end just because you've used the phrase the best that you can do several times. There is a story titled that. It comes from the song Arthur's Theme, the theme to the movie Arthur, where the best that you can do is fall in love, which is maybe sort of a mixed blessing sometimes. But there are many very sweet moments in the stories throughout all of the collections being held by a grandparent, watching TV with a sibling, letting someone in, or dancing. So I was wondering if just to close, would you read the last paragraph to the story Long Time Coming? And we'll just have it without context, but I think all the things we talked about, you'll hear the song, the lyricism, and the echo of the title. Mm -hmm. Someone put on a new record. Lucas pulled her in arms circling her waist as Sam Cooke sang of being born by the river and predicted that a change would come. All around them, couples were slow dragging and no one took notice of them dancing together, just as no one had noticed his constant presence at her side after bringing her back from breaking up the fight. There in a crowded apartment in a tenement on a block where she had lived her whole life and thought there was nothing left for her to discover, She learned how a simple touch could awaken her and make her see the world in a new light, could shift all the things she thought she knew. Lucas had stopped laughing and joking, stopped talking altogether, and now just held her close. They didn't need to talk at all any longer. The song was in their ears and their hearts were in the song, and listening was the best that they could do and all one ever need do and they would never need any more words between them because all the words there were had all been said and they danced there, two throbbing, listening hearts and each breath was a beat and each beat was a breath and however they moved forward in life from this moment on, they would always know. Yes, they would always know. Well, I just want to say thank you so much and say how much I appreciate you and your work. And I'm going to be rereading all these stories for a very long time. So thank you, Amina. Thank you so much, Dylan. You can check out The Best That You Can Do, as well as the other story collections by Amina Gautier here at the library in our podcast collection. You can also find out more information on her website, aminagautier.wordpress.com. That's our show. A special thank you to Amina for taking the time to talk with us and to Megan Fishman and Soft Skull Press for helping to coordinate this conversation. And thank you for listening to our 62nd interview episode. Comments and feedback are always welcome and can be sent to podcast at deerfieldlibrary.org. Go to deerfieldlibrary.org slash podcast to learn more about our show and find links to subscribe. You can also follow the library on Facebook, Instagram, X, TikTok, or check out our YouTube channel. Links are on our website or in our show notes. We'll be back next month. Thanks for listening.